Okay, welcome everybody to the October 1st meeting of the OSC dev team. I'm starting this meeting with a picture of this sweet micro tractor. So this is the build. Let me share my screen for everybody to look at. Um, my camera's also on. Yeah, so I'm sharing the screen. If you follow along here. So, yeah, yeah, let's let's do that. Tractor was a major success. Uh, page one here is, so we're going to review the tractor build, then um, talk a little bit about a microcontroller, remote controller. Um, more work would be the big tractor and kind of regrouping, you know, I mean, let's do that up in the intro, regroup and reorganize where are we right now, because all the, the major workshops for right now are pretty much done for the year. And we want to see how best to go forward. Um to make the best of our collective efforts organize um, if you notice on the uh, page number one there we got ourselves a little spike on October 29 as far as the development effort and what is that well that's essentially Lex and Josh who were here and they were definitely counting these hours as contributions to their development time which is you know, during the workshop they were here so We've got about, um, I mean, that is over 200, close to 300 hours. So like 10, you know, eight, seven, eight people equivalent almost. But that's good. That's good. Um, we, we see if you look at the historical graph of here, you can see that like the first spike on May 1st, that was actually when we had the first 3D printer workshop. So every time during a workshop time, we have either like a lot of preparation on site or you know a spike of effort to get the documentation or just that people from the team participate during the build and, and spike up those hours so that's pretty good good uh, good last week um, so I'm gonna just dive into just the product review of what what we have done and the issues that we have encountered I'm gonna refer to the the micro track CAD to look at some of the details that we have changed because uh, there were definitely a few changes that we had to make and altogether um, the time stretched to being able to build only the micro tractor there were definitely a few issues that we encountered things where the CAD was just didn't do it for us and we had to redo what we did. So you can effectively say we built two tractors but it ended up as one tractor because a lot of parts we just ended up redoing for various reasons. For reasons like well it's an experimental workshop, some of the CAD wasn't correct, incomplete instructionals, um, lack of torch table. I mean a torch table would have nailed all the well torch table plus correct design would have nailed all the issues but altogether a majorly successful build. I, uh, I uh, put out the review form for people and most people gave a five-star review to this um, to this workshop which is great um, so we got probably like 4.5 or so on a review from about 10 people who have provided feedback I actually had people provide feedback like right in the last day's review session so that was good so quick quick walkthrough you see the the bucket tooth bar separable tooth bar built um, tractor driven we added a flow control valve to drive the tractor slowly. The tractor did end up spinning in circles, as in if you turn one level lever forward and the other in reverse, you can spin it in, in a circle, which means that you have ample traction upon the tracks. The bucket, I mean, just amazing. It, I mean, quite a highlight. Um, and I'll actually zoom in on a detail but we've got the tooth bar we've got the nice geometry we've got the bobcat standard on the back we even attached a little hook on the front a, a utility hook right there you see that's that's very useful for pulling chain or whatever you have um so that was that was quite nice uh we put a supporting crossbar we just ended up using a, a two by two tube the arms you see we did not um kind of cover them on top it turned out the geometry as it was we had to extend the actual connection points up to the the top of the arms uh, simply because things didn't fit I mean you know the CAD um, 
Yeah, I mean, for whatever reasons, the main, I think one of the main reasons was that the tight space between the fittings of the cylinders um, and just the geometrical, yeah, I mean, I, I can't really tell. I mean, we kind of had the, the correct dimensions within CAD for the length of the cylinders as far as I knew, but um, we ended up welding these uh, triangles which were 4.5 inches high onto the top of the arms to support, to have the support points for both the cylinders. And the first cylinder we mounted it on a, yeah, on a bar, on a crossbar here and everything else. So, um, more review. The thing that pretty much killed us was uh, actually the, the motors. Uh, what we ended up doing, and I'm going to go into the CAD to show you, to walk through this. Um, let me put everything into the CAD. CAD view. Okay. My computer's slowing down. Okay, so let's take a look at this, because um, this is this is a good chance to review everything that that happened. We thought was gonna <clears throat> what we thought we were gonna see in in uh, in reality that didn't happen. But the thing that um, so let's start with the motors. So turns out the motors are, I mean, they're bigger than this. That that pancake there. Turns out it's a little wider, and what happened was that the motor stuck out so far that we just lost all the length. So what we ended up doing is take this vertical, and actually we 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 torched it off after we built it, because we could find out only after the reality has shown itself. So we took the vertical and we torched it and moved it two inches in inside the frame, uh, and that gave us enough room such that the motor itself, which was wider than in a CAD here wider as in its length was wider we pretty much inset the motor into the frame such that we have enough room so we still retain a 42 inch uh, width of the tractor now we could have just left it exactly as is we would have ended up with I think the number I mean the number was small we would have ended up with 44 but we said okay let's really nail this issue because it's something that we would want to solve in the future so we said okay let's solve it right now Let's move those motors in and see if we can still end up with a 42 inch tractor. And once again, 42 inch being a very tiny width uh, for getting into tight spaces. So a very practical utility machine. We didn't want to compromise on a width, which was to us a very, uh, a major part of the design effort. So we actually tried to address the width twice with the motor. And, and so let me explain. So here's the sprocket. Um, it, it needs to be over the tracks as it is. But what it turned out, and we thought we had it, we we had it nailed. So what we did was we took the sprocket, we built up the coupler, such that the sprocket could actually go over this part here, uh, and we did that because uh, one, the motor was too wide, and we looked at it, and that that was that. But when we did that, unfortunately, there was conflict with these parts here, and we couldn't see that until we actually put the track on. So we spent an epic effort remaking this coupler you know putting an extension around it so we can weld the sprocket on an extension of the round coupler upon this part here but we ended up co with conflicts with both the fittings and the bolts the little bolts that are here that are, that are not shown uh, and it was just marginal it was like a quarter inch you know quarter inch of interference but we had to completely grind down the sprocket redo it and mount it once again a little farther out but because we had to mount it farther out to avoid the bolt conflicts the, the just the spatial track hitting the motor conflicts we had to then end up torching as i mentioned the vertical so that the motor would still allow us the 42 inch width so that was like wow that's i mean that's like you can think about how much effort that took that probably mu pretty much ate up a whole day of effort because you know everyone else was bottlenecked at that point uh we couldn't get the machine running, but we did get it running as far as the drive system by sun, um, Monday morning, which was yesterday. And yesterday we also finished the arms and everything else and a quick connect. 
but that was a major effort. Now we did torch the major, so yeah, I mean, successful. What we have ended up showing is that we can do the actual manual torching of this very successfully. I mean, so, so our people at the workshop who are novices, we taught them basics of how to torch. Lex actually torched out most of the uh, sprockets by hand and they worked perfectly. I mean, they weren't super pretty uh, or super, you know, super um, precise. They might have been like within an eighth inch or, you know, eighth inch plus minus on the, the critical parts being the round parts where the actual rollers of the chain rest. But it worked great. I mean, the, the figure of Merit there is, does the track skip? Does it drive? Yes, it drove and it did not skip. It was perfect. So we have learned during this build that simply having a torch, a welder, and a grinder would be sufficient to make this entire machine, which is a great proof of concept because we've shown that you don't, don't need a torch table to do it. Now it takes longer to do it. So if you have access to a... Uh, the bought parts are the engine, you know, we buy the engine, uh, so the engine there, uh, we made everything else, uh, we buy, we actually bought the Bobcat fitted parts, both the, the male and the female, and this geometry here is almost, almost correct, what we ended up doing is with the, the, the quick attach standard, the plates ended up being welded right up to the edge of the plate. And maybe I, it seems uh, from what I see here on the male part that this, what, what we have drawn is might be actually too wide compared to what the reality is. Um, this plate actually appears to be wider than in reality. So we can change that. Um, but anyway, that's, that's some of the main issues we encountered. The motor mounting, which totally killed us. Uh, but after that, um, you know, team was really good. Everyone was working together, supporting each other. A lot of learning happening. Um, a bucket, I mean, turned out exactly as we have here. Uh, the only thing that, I mean, but once again, as, we, as I mentioned, we redid a lot of things. For example, this tooth here, it's very important that it's on the very edge. And this is absolutely correct. So whoever did that, they put the teeth tooth in about two inches, which is that really help, hurts the performance of the machine because that means when you're digging, you're gonna be like just digging essentially down to like two inches narrower on each side, and over time that would end up that your tracks cannot fit where you're going, so your digging pattern is completely messed up. So it's very important for this tooth here, the outer tooth, to be exactly even with the track, so that when you do dig this path as a nice sharp cut the tracks can actually fall in there as opposed to being on the upper part because this tooth didn't do anything and it because uh, if it were inside further so we redid that I, I mean I saw that and then it was like late last night actually but we did redo that um, to make it much better uh, what we ended up using here we did end up using the single block we ended up using instead of a bar we decided, because of the, the way the cylinder was, it was relatively hard to make a weld to the bottom end of the main cylinder. So we said, okay, let's leave that cylinder in <clears throat> intact. Let's use a quarter by, four, quarter by uh, two inch square tube. And we just welded a, a round tube to the inside so, that, so the actual pin uh, cylinder could be mounted um, to that. What else? The the dimensions in terms of lengthwise were perfect on a power cube. I mean, the power cube fit right in, nice and snug. The What we found out also is with the bigger cooler, what ended up happening is the fan, the, we, we got a 12-inch <clears throat> fan. So when we used the, the, tw the larger cooler, which was the 1260, uh, we used the 1260... I believe it was t actually 1268 Hayden cooler. Uh, the fan underneath the cooler ended up hitting the tank, so we, we used a smaller fan, which was an 8-inch diameter fan. But then we actually found out that there were further conflicts. It was really tight for these fittings here, both the in and out, uh, because the, the cooler is wider than shown here. Uh, it was somewhat tight, so we ended up putting the cooler and the fan actually on top of the grate. 
which means that it's not really protected from the elements or from stuff falling on it. So probably the next thing is to extend the frame up, frame of the power cube up perhaps two inches so that um, the fan and cooler can still fit. And what, uh, you know, while the CAD looked great and it, it seems like there's a lot of space, what, what ended up messing that up is we used these uh, about an inch tall rubber mounts for the engine, which are actually not shown here. And that's what that's part of the reason why the engine was put up so far that the fan did not fit. Okay, as far as the tank welding it and and epoxying it, uh, really good job. We uh, so one of our guys here welded one of the more experienced guys who did have experience with welding, and then we epoxied it. We ended up with one leak hole, which we then welded up ground down the epoxy and welded it up it smells when you burn it again with a with a welder um and we fixed it the first time around so the the hydraulic tank was relatively painless um we did a major design change on a on a raising mechanism so if you look at this you see that there's these sleeves that go up and down the arm the vertical arm supports what we ended up doing one change was we ended up using two bolts instead of one and in retrospect probably one would have been good enough but we kind of said okay let's do two so that's more evenly supported but the other thing was instead of using the sleeves here we just did one plate on the back and one plate all the way across on the front of the the holder so instead of making these dedicated sleeves we used one plate in the front, one plate in the back, and still the top plate. Um, so that means the bolt here was was uh, hidden. So we torched out a hole for the two holes for the bolts to, so we can get get at them and tension them. And when we did that, we found it was so difficult to tension them because you can you know you can only move the wrench back and forth so much with the two um, two bolts that we ended up welding another plate. On the bottom of the tensioner such that the nut is exposed on the outside so you can actually get much more of a better wrench hold on it which saved us time so we, we ended up modifying this quite a bit what we ended up doing is when this plate the front plate ended here the motor mount was just another plate going to the motor we actually removed this back plate here uh, and allowed the motor to pretty much bump against or touch against this vertical we were just pretty much thinking okay, what's the simplest way to do after we got into the crisis of this stuff uh, you know the coupler issue um, just simplify that but yeah I think that's a good good deal that worked well um, instead of using so many pieces like from four pieces eight pieces nine ten as shown here we ended up doing one two three and four so four pieces for all those pieces until uh, this side there so part count reduction from ten to four which wasn't obvious until we start to build it and we say whenever you build it you say okay you got this cut list and you see hmm you know that's a lot of cutting and then you immediately start thinking okay well this has got to be simpler we don't I mean we got all these pieces that you have to mark and then cut on the iron worker so uh, we definitely questioned it at that time, which probably we wouldn't have if we had a CNC torch. We, we would have just said, okay, we're cutting that out and then welding it together. So uh, I do think the simplification is worth it. And definitely uh, you wanted the accessible nut there. And this whole mechanism, it worked great. I mean, the, ten the tracks tensioned perfectly and all that. Uh, that was good. Okay, another design change here. We have the clamp on the outside here. And we don't show the shaft here. But what, what we ended up doing was torching out the big three inch holes. We uh, put a, the three inch DOM, the precise tubing material inside that hole. And then we, we just one inch of it. So here it's, we have half inch thickness here, right? Is that half inch? Oh, actually we're showing, we're showing one inch arms here. No, that's, that's, that's gotta be half inch here. We used half inch material there, so for that bushing for the shaft to the bushing which is welded to the arms there, 
that bushing was only one inch wide, so we could weld that in without, you know, without taking up that space. And what that allowed us to do was to use a single clamp, uh, not on the outside, but on the inside. So we took, we actually torched, we had a bunch of these clamps, so we torched them into halves, which, so you have one bolt on each side. We put the clamp on the inside, right up next to the bushing, and we did that on each side, so those small clamps inside this area were sufficient to, um, to clamp down the whole arm set, which was good. Uh, so we, we completely redid this mounting here. Um, yeah, I mean, here this looks good, but it turned out, I mean, that space there was pretty tight. Um, yeah, I mean, the CAD, CAD just, you know, just little things like the fittings, like the fitting here had to go up because we didn't want it to go down to the tracks. Uh, so various just detail issues of all the fittings and the geometry and somewhere like these, uh, we can read, you know, take a look at again at whether the verify whether the cylinder specs we have here are correct but here like for example that width uh, I actually ended up getting the bigger cylinder with the one inch shaft oh yeah so that's different than in the CAD here yeah naturally we have to update that and see that see whether in the CAD we can actually see those interferences that we were talking about why it wouldn't fit but um, which means the answer is probably yeah, just just rework, see, you know, evaluate that, update the CAD to what we have exactly, so everyone can look at it in real life. It would be very nice for me to then uh, just do some more documentation on exactly the as as built. So so take a picture of all the details that have been changed, and we can update the CAD accordingly, so that everyone can look at it and and um, examine the improvements that need to be made exactly as they should be. So. That's that. Uh, further, we took out this this middle piece. Um, don't really need it at this scale of a machine. Uh, it's actually an artifact from the former frames, but this middle piece we took it out. And what that allowed us to do is uh, the clamps. Oh yeah, so the clamps we modified their location as well. So the plates that we had, we actually had the, these wheel mount plates for these shafts from the the tractor of 2015 i.e. the big tractor, the the one that I used to do the key line plowing and nut planting of the 20 acres. Um, we had those plates, so we reused them, but however, the and, and those plates, the shaft was right up to the to the metal. We didn't have that half inch space or any space for the the collar here. So what we did is we took the collar and we put it right on the inside that edge there. Uh, so we put the collar against that fa face such that only the half inch of the collar was gra grabbing, but that's fine. Um, and there we used, we had one bolt clamps, one, I mean, a pair of bolt clamps, not triple, just a single clamp. That was enough. And besides the six inch ones, because that space is exactly 12, fit, 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 because it's just a little too na too narrow for them to fit. Uh, and the one inch bolt clamps, they're very, very strong. They have three, three quarter inch bolt holes and that's half inch material to, uh, that clamps around the shaft. So not a problem there. The tracks we did exactly as in this picture. Uh, so that's all good. The idlers are pretty much exactly as built. The, f the width, we were aiming for 42 inches and what did we get? exactly 42 inches so we ended up doing exactly what we have in the CAD as far as the overall width let's see do it uh, are the tracks here 10 inches or 9 inches let's see yeah oh actually here they're 9 inches we we're using 10 inch tracks and that means we had a little less gap there um, we didn't end up cutting our tracks any like from the 10 inches that they already are um, that worked altogether, but even though that space is slightly smaller, not a problem. Let's talk about the loader loader arms and let's wrap up the this arm support. So we used two of these arm supports that we ended up using them about about these are here shown are what are they about six inches? We we ended up having them about four inches. We cut off that uh, because we used two of the tensioner uh, threaded rods. We ended up cutting off about two inches 
from one, one end so we can move this tensioner up against this side and this other side. So that's notes on the tensioner. And continuing on some of the CAD just to walk through the whole thing. Loader arms. How do we do them? So that would have been a lot of cutting by hand. So we actually did um, the bo the loader arms are half by five steel on this part. So we actually ended up using a half by five steel piece, a straight piece that you already you just cut to length. And therefore that means we cut it off right there at this knee and we torched out the rest. What we did is we took uh, the fab drawing of this. Uh, so we did that during the workshop. We torched one out and used it as a pattern for all the others. And then when we were ready to put this hole in there, we took four of these these knee pieces and match drilled them using the magnetic drill so that that drill go can go through four layers of this. So there's one, two, three, four. We did that by taking all those pieces and drilling through all at once. But we did that, we drilled that all at once after we welded the two pieces together. So metal is convenient and you can take two pieces and just make them, put them together like it was one piece. So that's what welding does. So once we had four of the arms, we just put them all together and match drilled this hole. And that, at that point, we mounted the the arms on the shafts loosely with the with a bushing with a slightly oversized hole I mean just very slightly so we hung the the first loader arm to get the geometry here and then we figured out okay let's use this we were fumbling with what to use there if we didn't want to use that shaft so we ended up using the quarter by two uh, we first welded this bottom mount of the main cylinder to that or, or looked at where that has to be we found pretty quickly that for the cylinders to fit, both this top top cylinder and the other one had to be above in order not to conflict. Um, we found that um, for the actual quick attach plates, since they do not, the ones that we got off the shelf, the Bobcat standard, it does not have these here verticals. So we had to weld them, we had to find out where exactly they're going to be. So we put the the female part of the quick attach and the male part we basically locked them into each other we put it in front of the tractor and found out exactly where those uh, mounting tabs have to be and it turned out they were exactly against the edge um, of the male quick attach part and that worked out well so we were able to weld that in place with the with the quick attach in place we put in the secondary cylinder to find well where does that hole have to be so we ended up finding out that, yeah, we have to extend it just like the main cylinder. So slowly, inch by inch, we, we put in, uh, we found the geometry for one side. We, we built that those extender plates. We mounted the cylinders. And then we raised the arms up and down. The reach is very nice. It's probably what we have. Let's see, loader you look at that what it is fully oh I, I took it out of the, I took the raised one out but yeah it has a nice lift height you know just just like we predicted in a CAD to about you know line like right there so nice dump height and altogether very nice looking machine and things are working on it so uh, I look forward to using that testing it so far we've put in a flow control valve to control the speed and when we did the test run we first started by a straight single valve uh, two spool valve the thing was fast wow it is really fast like 4.5 miles per hour I mean that thing just takes right off and, and it's pretty dangerous so we put on a flow control valve to slow down the speed of the, the wheels uh, when you're out in the open I mean, we start this in a, in a workshop, but when you're out in the open, you can do that fast speed for travel, but in general, if you're not paying attention, you can, if you're, and you're standing right behind the tractor, it's pretty dangerous because the thing actually moves quite fast. Um, so definitely you want to be standing on a platform or reduce the speed. Uh, so we did the flow control valve to reduce the speed. 
and that way we could do what you see if you look at the OSC Workshop's Facebook page you can see some of the initial drive test um, on um, oh yes yeah, so I just posted that posted the tractor on the OSC Workshop's Facebook page this this picture if you scroll down a few you'll see some of the videos of the initial drive uh, as we were working that by Lex uh, that's some of the build pictures good stuff um, yeah really good so continuing that that that's where we are in a tractor so the next priorities are to refine us what we want to do still I mean man this this bucket with aggressive teeth and an attraction that machine looks so solid and the geometry of it is very nice and tight uh, so we were all really pleased on the overall outcome and this is the machine here you're basically curling the bucket downwards it's it's farthest in its downward position uh, but yeah of course I mean the machine just lifts itself right up um, yeah I mean there's a lot thousands of pounds of force there I don't know exactly how much but that's that's how it looks right now very impressive it looks very streamlined as in like yeah just kinda like this slant going up the single power cube there we did not do the second power cube and I don't think we're gonna want to do that for some time until we get the hang of all just refine and fine-tune all the motion and everything else and um, right now we've just got temporary valves attached so then to work out all the proper hose routing and the final valve configuration including the operator platform and holding bars uh, so that the operator can stand on this comfortably and probably as the normal course of action definitely recommend that the operator stands on this for safety reasons because if you go backwards at a, if you're at a fast speed um, that this thing just takes right off and and it could go over you know run you over so that's good one more note the tooth bar is removable we put you see those bolts there uh, so we can use either the smooth bucket or the aggressive digging bucket the teeth are uh, sharpened this is the same open source tooth bar as I did first around 2008 that design is good so we're ready for some good action here so immediate applications would be to also do the trencher the vibratory trencher that Josh was working on uh, we can implement that pretty easily to bury a bunch of cable and do some work uh, probably some you know erosion control stuff with this for some testing and other general utility tasks such as going into the forest and getting out logs and and firewood things like that um, we did do the remote control box I act I don't think I have a picture in here so the remote control box was the Arduino so just just moving on to the next next item here um, remote controller a box with an Arduino and an XB uh, wireless or, or remote control radio frequency uh, so one box was the controller which talks to through the wireless to the second controller the little controller box inside an electric enclosure which rests on the tractor so you can you can move this remotely so basically the buttons you, you hit the buttons on your the handheld controller and then you can see that the same solenoids that are activating the the solenoid valves we did not install the electric solenoid valves but in principle you've got the when you press a button on one box the same same solenoid uh, or relay opens up on a second box so basically you can do either like you can plug in the, the solenoids directly into the first box or you have a full remote control mode where you plug in the tractor to the second box so you can operate either one or the other uh, or actually both I think when you turn on both remote control and manual control you can plug in the tractor to the box directly the manual manual version of the remote control or plug in with a wire to the receiving box so it's basically two control boxes one is the one you hold in your hand and the other one is the one that rides on the tractor so that's cool uh, definitely worth doing like say say you're doing some work with a tractor where you know you're 
you know, you're knocking down trees and it's dangerous. Yeah, you want to use remote control or just if you don't want to be on it when you're doing some aggressive digging, uh, definitely saves your body on that. So very good. Um, so that's that's pretty much uh, the report from the weekend. So overall, very exciting. Last night, I mean, to, to put on the loader arms and just finish it off it was up there like to 2 a.m. actually last night because, yeah, everything took a lot of time and all that. Here we have the quick couplers. Everything is quick coupled right now, etc. The The levers, the quick attach works beautifully. I mean, you, you take out, you know, uh, turn the levers up, the bucket comes off and things like that. So very nice. And right now it's machine, the machine is pretty much human scale, like two people can actually lift the bucket, you know, things like that, so it's nice, compact. I mean, yeah, 42 inches, that's a relatively small machine, but very powerful, so we're glad. Um, so regrouping and reorganizing, so where are we on the tractor itself? So so we do want to continue on the tractor work and pr probably do the, update the CAD on the micro track so I can go down there and actually take some measurements and so forth so that we can update this CAD. But I mean, this is really good. I mean, in fact, already somebody has emailed me pointing to the workshop and, and asked me, how much are you charging for this tractor? The person already wants to buy one of these. Um, so the goal would be to uh, do some refinements and optimize certain things. But I'd like to run workshops on this. I, I think a lot of people really like this. Uh, it was a great experience for everyone involved. So we definitely want to take this to, to full product release pretty soon. Um, so the promise is being delivered. I mean, this this is pretty high performance. Let's talk about the, the big tractor, which we want to continue. So you guys, if you want to maybe ask some questions of where we are on that. So the priorities at this point would be to, to finalize this, this CAD here. We've got the, the big tractor. Uh, what I'm going to be doing back here, so as I regroup, would be to go back to the torch table and then any next build we do, we want to pretty much relax until that torch table is up and running so we can be cutting all the steel and so forth. So there's that. There's also the uh, to wrapping up things on a 3D printer where we want to do the next iteration of the extruder. And if you guys have seen the latest developments on the Prusa open source 3D printer, there are some features there that we want to incorporate, but we don't have to worry about that for now. But it's very impressive. The open source Prusa printer right now has the capacity where, for example, you bump the head and you move it by accident. The printer, the controller actually understands because of the feedback from the stepper motors where you moved it and it moves it back into position. I mean, that is amazing. So the feedback on the level of the actual controller where the the printer itself knows where it's at so it has removed the end stops man that i mean that's just amazing so you don't even need end stops because the printer has feedback built into the actual controller that's something very worthwhile but we don't have to worry about that yet um we our next step on the printer is to do exactly what we have with a 12 inch bed printer and just refine the the extruder head so it's really robust like we um so roberto I was going to ask you, did the printer arrive to where you are? Oh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, so, but that should be there any day. It said six to ten days from, and that was over two weeks ago or something like that. Um, yeah, so we're close to, to getting there. Um, that's good. But those are the three main things right now. I can, four, I mean, four there's the, the tractor, the torch table the micro tractor and the printer those are very active projects and Matt Droder from the robotic operating system rossagriculture.org he's still here so he's still actually gonna install the GPS model he's actually traveling to St. Louis where the another developer is and they're gonna come back on Saturday to actually do the install of the uh, GPS module which guides itself by GPS signal so for the autonomous tractor so that's that's really nice um uh guys tell me some of the questions that we have i know we've been uh, discussing the big tractor there's some some main considerations we should probably take some notes on what are the main design requirements so that because there's many questions i mean right now we're open to since we don't have any pressure on the timing because we're tr trying to get a design that we can actually build out for the workshop 
And I do believe if, uh, because of the experience that everyone on our team during the workshop got, if we were done with this micro track, we could have potentially even built the big tractor because it would have been much easier. We didn't have any of those tight space considerations as in the micro track. So we could have potentially have done that in a single day. But right now we have uh, the open ability to source any other parts that we need. We initially said we've got 36 inch and 24 inch cylinders. Uh, we can do whatever cylinders lengths we need. The the bottom line is it should be functional and comfortable for an operator. But what we should start with on that, since we are working on that actively, um, we should definitely go over the some of the requirements just to, to make that clear. So I'm going to start another page here. Um, Absolutely. Everything thoroughly so that the CAD uh, matches the micro track and all that so that we don't have confusion and problems yes. in the future. Absolutely. And um, yeah, give me a day or two to do that. I've got to pretty much catch up on some other tasks because on the home front here, uh, over the last week we have um, installed the open source hydronic stove and I still actually have to do the hydronic control panel. So I'll be working on it for the next day or two. Uh, I can possibly get um, all the changes, dimensions. I mean, one, we can look at the, uh, basically review what I talked about in the last 50 minutes. But the second part is taking detailed picture details of every single component on this existing tractor. So that, so I can do that. But hopefully, um, yeah, do that. Uh, that's that's a good priority uh, and anyone else who is free to do stuff we can get them going on a on a big tractor but we should definitely have the preparation in place that we are ready to do work on both since we do want to do that and as far as the live track prototyping that uh, what I could probably do is uh, after we complete the design we want to go right to the prototyping stage and that and I'm there I'm thinking it's like one or two days where we actually build the whole thing and I I'm pretty sure we can do that because we have all the parts we've got the extra experience from this build um, one or two days would probably be enough to do the the build pending good preparation having some of the fabrication drawings and everything else but as I mentioned I don't want to do that until the torch table is in place but um, so on my side here the high priority is to get the to torch table operational so we can actually cut the parts for the live track whatever we need there um, so but we definitely want to prepare make the make the set up the the work uh, basically define the work breakdown for both projects since they're they're active yeah I was gonna say the, the notes on here I'm taking probably aren't really detailed because sometimes I'm not seeing the video like what you were pointing to in the CAD so mm -hmm. but if you're recording this somebody could uh, maybe, maybe you or somebody that knows the changes on the live track could do an outline on the wiki yes and then other people kind of break it down so they can fill in from the video what you're pointing to and you know if you need to uh, document more of the stuff and then the photos later uh, with measurements so yes yes so Lex and Josh are fully qualified to um, make all those changes since they've seen it here so that is good we can definitely get them on this so let's actually start another page here so one is life track requirements and second is the task as, as we typically do the task list being specific on what that is so yes um, so task list task one also it's update micro track CAD so the details there are listen to this video if you haven't been 
then at the build event uh, Marchin takes pictures picture details pictures of as built detail and then remote CAD so Lex and Lex and Josh um, can do some things already and then remote collaborators uh, take a look at the pictures So then for the pictures, there's also uh, examine all the other repositories of pictures. I know there's several, been several people from other people, from others during the workshop. Uh, there's also one more task, and that is, and it's not... You know, not not really critical, but we have a full time lapse of every single day. I actually posted a bunch of that on the YouTube channel for um, for Factory Farm for OSC. Out of that, you can look at the uh, if you're aware of the CAD, you can see okay, people are working on specific tasks. You can actually get out the ergonomics of build, how much time it took to do certain things. That's that's doable. Like for example, how much time did it take for people to to torch out the sprockets manually. Uh, so if you've got a keen eye, you can work with a video recording, the time lapse, in which one minute corresponds to one hour of build time. So that's another task, but I, I wouldn't prioritize that um, so much. Secondary priority, just to say that it exists, but I'm not gonna allocate anyone explicitly to that. Um, if someone says watching this video and they wanna do that, who are not on the team, they are welcome to do that. So secondary priority, um, take build time data from the video time lapses. One of the comments that came out during the workshop was Lex, who's offering to do like a little station, like a documentation station where you have a video camera on it and it's a mobile station that you can roll it to your station and record exactly what you're doing. It has two big buttons, start and stop. So when you start it, uh, it starts recording. When, when you hit stop, it would stop recording. So something like a Raspberry Pi camera. So a Raspberry Pi with a monitor, very simple system for doing documentation. Uh, so you can record, like you can have these mobile stations during the workshop that if you're working on a specific part, take one of these stations, put it on you, hit start and then hit stop. So you get both the actual build detail and the ability to take the time data out of it from the from the time lapse recording. So that's going to be we're looking at that as one of the changes to improve the documentation coming out of this this workshop. So workshops that we have here. So um, the time lapses are pretty much data rich in terms of time time data. Okay, so update MicroTrack CAD um, work on LifeTrack. Uh, so here in this uh, in this task list, I probably would want to go back and scour the uh, OSC Workshops Facebook page and any other. Uh, I can email with others to follow up to ma maybe send me links to where they posted their materials. Um, uh, we could probably send out a a spe special documentation request form to all the participants saying simply uh, did you take pictures and where are they so a link for example to Facebook or whatever if they put on Google Drive or they they have it on their camera uh, ask them to upload it and send a link to the video and stuff like that so I'll actually write that down right so other as built pictures so then um, documentation request form I just put it put up a Google spreadsheet documentation request form for workshop participants 14 people participate in this workshop so it's rather small um, 
but that's part of the reason why we didn't get as far as we would have liked on the big tractor. The assumption was there was that we have 24 people uh, if we were to do everything. I'm not sure if that was clear within the event announcement, but uh, if we do an ambitious build of two machines, I mean, you need typically need more than 12 people to do that. Okay, so live track CAD. Let's uh, let's get into it. So uh, la next is so CNC torch. Uh, I, I mean, I'm going to try to keep to the promise of not doing any build without the torch table now. We know the pain and glory of doing non-torch table work, um, which, once again, for lower resource environments, you just need a torch welder and a grinder. So, CNC torch, um, testing, finishing. Uh, the, the torch table as is, the solution on it may be as simple as the settings on a stepper driver are incorrect, uh, because, but there are some move, is, movement issues. So testing, finishing, uh, there's the 3D printer, main priority there is the upgrade on the extruder. Um, let's see. Roberto, what did we decide on? Do we say that we're going to replicate the Prusa and then move to the full R design, or we're going to go full R design based on the Lulzbot design as the next step? What did we say was the next step? Remind me. Do you remember? Uh, yeah, I, I think that was uh, replicating the Prusa yep. extruder. Yep. And that's a good way to to have you actually participate and get familiar with everything before we go more ambitious and and actually design our own and it's uh, you'll see that you know just like we design the tractor it's like to design the extruder itself so you just have to go through the process and but at that point we're gonna have full control over the device just like for example right now with a micro track I mean we have got full control over every single part of it and it's completely repairable, transparent, open, um, doable in the home workshop, if you like. So that's the 3D printer. Oh, good news from the... Uh, uh, so remember I was talking about Tech for Trade. They and I had a conversation with them. So uh, Filament Maker. I had a conversation with them and they decided to go to be fully open source. Uh, so that's great news. I'm going to have a conversation with them in the next few days. But they have the PET extruder, so PET plastic, which is a very common, very widely accessible plastic that can be recycled into filament. So we're going to look at uh, uh, helping them on their their version. I think we want to definitely finish up our version of the, the ABS extruder just for more experience, but they have an open source design that's in a pretty good shape that they're actually you know they've used it to to build to make filament so we can collaborate with them to see what uh, what what is there to do that they actually have a more advanced version in their version they actually have a water bath it's a it's pretty much like the next step up in extrusion in the extrusion world but that's good um, so there, there's the Lyman and there's the tech for trade Tech for trade, the African extruder. Yeah, um, those are the, kind of the main things on a plate here. But let's let's get right into the the tractor requirements. So let's go through that. So we can definitely break it down into uh, the main components as we normally do, and we want to go through what are the main requirements for each. So just a simple diagram here. Um, cab. I mean, we've got these diagrams. There's the tracks. Just, just really quickly. Arms. And then power cubes. And there's the cylinders both the primary and secondary there's the quick attach main consideration is how do we make the cab tracks and arms fit together uh, and and then where do you mount all the cylinders so we should be specific 
um, on what those requirements are. So, so the there were various questions that were raised through this process. So maybe let's let's take a look at all those questions and turn them into requirements. So, guys, uh, question number one. Mm -hmm. And some comments we weren't, uh, we interpreted them, I guess, differently. Mm -hmm. Roberto was looking at that. Uh, and I realized, I think I was making some assumptions about where the cylinder might go or what the operation could be of that. I think you kind of suggested the cylinder be mounted to the bottom frame. And first I was thinking we'll just weld it at the back, at the cab. And of course, Roberto, he moved it down already in the cab. A shaft or not way down below and mm -hmm. there's consequences to that multiple um, yeah I was and it could go almost vertical but that means that then the arm wouldn't actuate the full uh, 36 inches which could be good for less stress on the cylinder but it also really fast fast um, and and I don't know how how uh, I'm not really sure how that would be limited. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to limit it for safety, uh, mm -hmm. so it doesn't. But he doesn't put it up too high, and it flips back or something ridiculous. Um, yeah. So I wasn't sure um, how some of that that actuates with the hydraulics. It could be put in a few different positions there. Yeah. I was. It was almost 90 degrees back there. It would make the short the, the stroke on it a lot shorter, and uh, it would be. Put it in the right position it would move 90 degrees to the arm um and it would you could almost maintain that 90 degree angle so it yeah. would be a sharp angle for the load but then I, I was just realizing a while ago that you'd have to do some different uh, fittings because you, at the cylinder looks like i think you're just kind of welding it to the the shaft and i think that might have been I don't know if it sounded like on the micro track there might have been some details from the CAD with the cylinders, maybe because they were they were recycled and maybe they were cut and rewelded different before. We didn't know exactly what the fittings on the ends are uh -huh. uh, because you can't weld it to the frame. Obviously, you're going to have a have to have a clevis with a pin there so that it can rotate. Right. And it's not exactly which what's in the CAD. You have to something there or do something different on the end of the yeah cylinder. cad i mean cad is not complete by any way so we have to look at this so let's take the cylinder mounting requirements um let's go through that um, as we open up yep the other change i guess if you put them down on the frame somewhere would be you may not need that shaft anymore except that, exactly yes um Tensioner was attached to the shaft up above, but I don't know if you, it sounded like you changed some of that on the micro check, so maybe some things you learned there are applicable. But it seemed like that tensioner is just a whole bunch of sheet metal across there, and you might be able to frame something up on both sides and then just have two tensioners with less material that could save a lot of material. Oh, yeah. Uh, I th are you refer like, for example, that, yeah. Okay, so let's let's do one thing at a time. Let's go through the the mounting, uh, but they're related too, though, uh, because how you mount the. By the way, the the power cube, the master power cube, has gonna be the has to be the top one, because otherwise you would have priming problems. So let me let me put that down as a as a power cube issue. So I'm I'm just listing a bunch of issues. Power cube mounting, the master power cube, the one with the reservoir, is higher or equal height, equal uh, level. In other words, if you're trying to suck the hydraulic fluid from a power cube that's below you, you're going to have some priming issues. Master power cube is higher or equal level with other power cubes. Um, so tensioner uh the learnings from this tensioner are that the two plates all the way across they're good enough and then so across work well 
I mean, what's the, but how do you translate to a requirement? It has to have structural strength and it cannot move side to side. So cannot move side to side, it can move up and down. I mean, that's obvious, can move up and down. Uh, pay attention to easy access to the bolt head to actually do the tensioning. The good thing is you do that only once, like you do that and then, you know, your tracks should be good for a long time. Uh, so clear, clean access to the bolt for tensioning to, to the nut. Okay, cylinder mounting. So you said the two different mounts of, of uh, a shaft versus just on the bottom where you don't need a shaft, and that's exactly correct. What you drew there, uh, can you guys see my screen still? Can you guys see the screen? Intermittent. Okay. Uh, I have the cat open, so. Okay. If you and I'm looking at the October 30th version from which Roberto did the last update on, with the loader arms in the upper position and the lower position. Is that the one you you guys are looking at? Yes. Okay. So you have drawn one ver. Yeah. I mean, look at that. If you mount it at the very base, that that works right but yeah i mean that's totally acceptable right so that means you get this i mean look at how high you get you get uh to the tipping point of the bucket that's i mean that's pretty high uh and it's pretty good do we know can you tell me the distance to the bottom of the bucket there Um, the cab, let's see the, I'm going to take some measurements here. So the cab itself, currently we have it at 53 inches. So like four feet and a little more, almost, uh, almost 60 if you include the bottom of that. So it's about five feet. Um, and that's in, um, yeah, I mean, that's what you, what we have there. I mean, that's pretty good. Um, do you have a specific number for the bottom of the teeth or the bottom of the bucket to the ground? I've got I got five feet plus about one foot, so six, about seven. It's about seven. It, height is quite good there. Um, so that mounting that you show there is good. To, now to the bottom of the tracks, I've got 80, 80 inches. From the the bucket tip to the to the bottom of the tracks. Yes. Does that weight? Yes. Yep. 80, 80 inches? Yes. Mm hmm. 80 inches is a little less than 7 feet. I mean, that is quite good uh, for high loading. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's quite good. Uh, so, what you drew there is actually nice. And uh, what we care about is the cab width allows the operator to, to get in there. Currently, in that drawing there, we have cab width. of 30 inches, which means that if we are using 4x4 tubing, the space in between that is 22. Um, <clears throat> do you think that's acceptable there? Uh, for the cab, what I think we were wondering was, I, I came up with a way to extend the um, Attach plate so it was still compatible and we could move the arms out to 48 inches, but it involves a whole bunch of changes. So, but the, right now, obviously, the arms are in the, the current cab space, they're well, they're directly in line with the existing uh, cab frame. Yeah, they have the to come out a little bit. Be, I think the cab would be 24 inches then. Yeah, we want to set some limits for the what we have for the machine width. So right now in a CAD we have the cab width is 22 inches. If you use, well, if it's 30. It's 30, 31. Uh, is it 31? 
What is it exactly there? Well, the, the inside of the cab currently is it would it needs to, it would have to be moved in. Uh huh. Right. Because the arms are directly above it. Uh, so yes. That would be eight so. Inches less. So the num number one requirement is determined by the mounting of the quick attach plate, right? And are we assuming, so for the quick, for, for the Bobcat standard, we can make different assumptions such as, well, the requirement is no more than 45 inches, correct? Because that's as wide as the Bobcat standard plates come. Is that correct? Yeah, what... Um what I was thinking finally, I kept trying to think of a way to make some kind of adapter because all, all that matters is the, the male quick attach plates are 45 inches or less you know, wide so that they fit into a maximum 45 inch plate. Um, what I realized finally was that you could just weld some extension pieces on the sides of the um, quick attach plates. And actually mm -hmm. I assume that you're gonna be, you used the, the off the shelf versions that you bought and yeah. so now as you're going to use that to build custom ones mm -hmm. uh, for the live track so you can build them however you want so you could put some offsets and extensions on the sides of those that don't interfere with the female plate so that the arms could be wider yeah but um well but you want to limit yourself to being able to accept any bobcat implement of 45 inch wide mounting plate right so, so the requirement uh, is, yeah. The male plates would be at 42 inches, yep. the same as the uh, micro track. Uh huh. And, and then there would be extensions on the side such that the arms where it pins uh -huh. would be wider. Yeah, nice yeah. That's. Go on. <laughs> You can do that, but that's a significant complication to the build process. It uh, requires welding on more more pieces to those plates. Plus, um, to get those arms out four more inches on each side, you'd have to move the verticals behind the cab, and then those 45 braces would have to be well mm -hmm. to the side of the verticals and trim so that the arms could operate on the shaft above them. And let's see, that 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 also still allows you to, to mount the cylinder uh, down below on the frame somewhere because it's still in line with that uh, the outside of the frame there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's a um, and Roberto, uh, Roberto told me yesterday uh, the method actually that he used to do some of the constraints for the frame in here, and actually I think probably tell uh, so that it's recorded because he has a uh, method that's good for straining that frame parts in there. Uh, he also drew the, the arms and added the, the upper bucket. Um, so LT arm cylinder geometry document. Yeah, he, well, he added the, all that here to the uh, the master cat. Okay. Uh, huh. He, he and it, well, just let him tell the way. He, yeah. He did the frame, but he constrained it. Roberto, if you're there, you, I think it'd be good to describe how he, he used the assembly two workbench to import uh, a part to make it easier to constrain all those frame components. I think he kind of reworked that. Oh uh, yeah, I, I can I can uh, tell about that, but yeah, uh, I'm not sure if, if that is necessary now mm -hmm. or or there's another priorities because it's, it's, it's like a detail in the assembly process. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's not worry about it for now. Let's get clear on the what the requirements are. So so we have to take all that we're saying here and, and make some design requirement decisions based on which design requirements are the most important. So I would call for the number one requirement is that we do not complicate 
the mounting of the loader arms to the quick attach in other words allow it to be the same width and only upon that making the whole situation impossible do we look further so we're going to work hard first to keep the mounting without having to do any various modifications like for example in a current CAD we have the a certain width that lines up with a Bobcat standard as as is off the shelf right uh, pinning into the outer holes of the Bobcat standard of the Bobcat female and re remaining within 45 inches of of that and I see in the current CAD the actual mounting is like about one inch away the the male part is that so well it's um, yeah let's take that measurement there how far, what is that space between the mounting of the male and the side of the female there? It's about one inch or so. We still got one inch, so you got two inches there or so um, altogether from each side. Um, what what we can learn from this build is exactly what the the off-the-shelf quick attach looks like make sure that's accurate both here and in the micro track but what is wrong for example okay if, if we examine what we have currently in there we have a th if we have a 31 wide cab but it would have to be a little smaller because you want some space so say um, you got a maximum of 29 so say you leave one inch space between the cab and the arms going up and down so say you got 29 inches then if we use the 4 inch tubing then we're reduced to 21 inches which is pretty small one thing we can do is maybe say for the cab we're gonna use 2 by 2 inch tubing let's say uh, so we can do something like that if we have 29 minus 4 at that point that's 25 I mean that's a small I mean that's pretty small but I think possibly acceptable um, otherwise we have to look at other ways to to do this but it does look like we have uh, let's let's try that I mean uh, in a, what I'm seeing in a drawing Is that correct that we still have one inch of space that we can go outwards uh, with the arms? Or is that pushing it too close to the edge of the quick attach? I, I think the arms are currently aligned with the bucket quick attach and let's see, the symmetry is such that they're, they're I think they're pretty much against the verticals. Um, I think that they're planar with the verticals in the cab because I think they're actually constrained to oh. those verticals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see. So the outer, so we know that the outer arm to arm distance those let's see. Let's look arms at that. Are, are large and I, I think they have to be fabricated in two pieces obviously it looks like uh, I don't know if they can be 40 smaller. inches okay hold obviously, on hold on right there. there so I am measuring the outer arm to arm distance and I'm measuring 40 okay so we know that that could be you know if the width is 45 and we're we got just a little space that, that's 44 so we got four inches right there that we can expand the arms outwards right so okay let's look at the basic figures that we have we can put the uh, and let's document this for for the absolute limits of what we have to work with so um, uh, let's see uh, what we're saying here is that the cab is kinda like the the relationship between the cab and the ability to mount 
a quick attach in front of it where you can still have enough space in the cab that's one major cons consideration um, yeah what you're showing there on page three with those extenders yeah that, that was the the idea no. from Ave. no I I would try to stay away from that that is it's a little complicated those, so those are pictured that picture is actually a lot wider than the uh, 48 a lot wider actually right um, you'd only have to extend it like five inches on each side I think or something okay. for the so 48 inches that is complicated with the frame so okay I, I think that the current position of the arms is is mostly where it would have to be to maintain the 42 inch uh, bucket and it sounds like the main changes if, if we can narrow the cab and use that two by two framing that that might get us close enough uh yeah don't yeah. don't bring the bucket from the micro track in because we know that if we have the bobcat standard that bucket will fit because right now that actually that bucket oh yeah so i mean maybe I have not mentioned but right now in the picture that you see you see how the bobcat standard on page five of the document the the female part is actually sticking out a couple of inches and we left it there uh, because we didn't want to cut it off and okay. so let's assume that we have don't worry don't bring the micro track bucket in here just bring in the fact that you've got a standard female bobcat standard that let's not bring anything else in that's all we need to know for interoperability um, yeah see two so that they're compatible um, this one can't be the full 45 as far as the width because you want to interchange with the 42 on the micro track right no no leave that alone no. because even the 42 no. we can leave the ends cut off so you can have a wider thing and still catch it uh, look at page number oh. five either so, we cut so it off the, yeah you're just leaving the plate at 45 inches then yeah that or even if we cut it off look if on page five we cut it off down to 42 and don't weld the sides back in, you can still grab that with a big tractor. Correct? Yeah. Right. So don't worry about it. Uh, let's not confuse the discussion with any of those considerations yet. Um, so let's look at the b baseline facts. We've got a 45 inch wide quick attach. Uh, we need arms to connect to it as simply as possible okay um, I mean okay what you're drawing there yes we can do those extenders um, you can say that yes um, I think Abe the answer is we can do something similar to that but not exactly if you as you've drawn it um, but something quite similar uh, but try to remain as simple as possible so we got 45 inch wide we can make the arms such that the mounting that let's let's get nomenclature here so that I'm gonna draw the picture of what we're talking about so we we can have easy nomenclature so this is the uh, so I just drew there the bottom of the arm and then we need the other piece. Do you see it? We need another piece here. So under your picture, I'm just drawing a small picture of, that's the yeah. bottom of the arm. And what we have there on top of that is the place where the pin, so we had this little extender. And in that extender, we have a, a, a hole, which is a one inch hole for the pin. Okay, so we have that. So let's call that, um, I don't know, tang. Uh, look, Google the word tang. I think it, that's called a tang. Images. No, it shows tang as 
fish and tang the drink. But cylinder, let's see, uh, loader tang, or cylinder tang. Yeah, okay, exactly, that's a tang, okay? Google cylinder tang, and that's what you have. So it's the attachment point, a single one, a single tang, it's an attachment point. So that's the mounting tang on the loader, on the loader. So let's call that the loader tang, okay? So we're going to use this nomenclature. We call it the loader tang. And what is the requirement for the loader tang? You guys see that? Are you guys on the same page now? Yes. Okay. So we've got the the tang is the part with the hole in it. Mm -hmm. And what I'm showing there, just for anyone else, that's the bottom part of the loader arm. Okay, so we need the arms to connect to QA, so QA is the abbreviation for quick attach, for, let's call it the male quick attach and female quick attach, so male is the thing that's on the tractor, so MQA. Yeah, so we're not worrying what's on top, uh, what the female part is yet, of the quick attach. So let's talk about the male quick attach part, the part that's on the loader arms that sh that we're attaching to uh, through with the pins. So we're 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 at the connection of loader arm to the male quick attach, and we have 45 inches of width available. So what if we put so whatever our loader arms are. We can mount a tang on the inside part of the loader arm. Uh, so let me draw that. I'm going to start next page. In this design meeting, yeah. Um, I gotta get going not in about 15 minutes those guys so because we got to do this stove thing and we're freezing so <laughs> it's cold here right now um, so this is in this for the CD go home so um, so I'll still leave this little picture down at the bottom. So let's look at the possible mounting of the tang to the loader arm. So so we've got the loader arm looked at, so that's loader arm. Uh, here's the second loader arm. You know they're spaced so far apart. You've got the bobcat. The bobcat standard can be right there. Okay bobcat so it's MQA male quick attach well it's I mean it's two pieces of them but they're connected together um, two sides connected together right um, so what what I'm trying to say to you is that the the, the tang on the loader arm could be on a in in this picture could be on the inside So that you're getting yourself some extra space while not complicating the geometry here. Okay, so we're going to have this tang. And so let I mean let's let's kind of draw it how it would attach. Like say it's the bottom. It's really the bottom attachment, right? So at most you have this. Um, 
So the mounting tang is like this here. That's the tang. It's got the hole. It's got the hole in it. Wherever that hole is. I mean, it'll be towards the bottom there. Um, does that make sense? So that way we can have the most space available um, to support a cab in between the loader arms. Yeah. So that's that's to start with. So the dimensions here are 45 wide. What right? about the girl cylinder? Yeah, uh, that is an issue that you bring up and is exactly right. That's why the ideal condition is where the loader arms are behind this. Um, that's exactly right what you're saying because here the the curl cylinder would be somewhere here and that's an issue so there's a limit to what we can do with this um, the, the curl cylinder would be uh, somewhere there let's say you know because because the if we're remaining within the the Bobcat standard quick attach so but then the curl cylinders how how people do that sometimes is they actually make a mount on the inside of the loader arms and that's doable but once again that's complications uh, unless you do something like uh, it's a complication unless you do something like a big uh, shaft you know I mean there's ways to address it right so one way you can address it if you modify the cylinder not with the one inch pins but you know this bar across that that cylinder mounts to across the loader arms you know but you know that's this is devil in the details so the the um so what you see here is this gets complicated right that's the bottom line so we want to try to look for a simple solution so we want to we want to try to do what we did in in micro track which is beautiful so if you look at page six everything is behind your bobcat quick attach right it's sandwiched in between where the mounting is easy and so forth so typically what people have is the loader arm the cylinders are right in front of it it's easy to attach them and the so that's the curl cylinder and the main cylinder is also once again in line with the loader so it's easy to attach it as well otherwise attaching to the side is not as easy it's done a lot of times like if you look at the a lot of the bobcats their cylinder mounting is i believe on the inside because of this exact issue uh, yeah i think curl cylinders earlier in the email you had suggested that the curl cylinders could just be tacked on the front of the loader arms Yes, they can. The, so we don't have to go in between, but yes, on the front. Game. They can, yeah. And, let's see, I was wondering, too, if on this bigger tractor, you know, like I think you were just saying, too, it could be good to have a crossbar to tie those arms together. Yes, definitely. You want you want that, something to that effect, yeah. just like we have well, in the micro track. And it would have to go near the bottom... Uh, maybe you could put it right behind the bucket. Uh, uh, another thing is, I think I think Roberto shortened the uh, oh yeah the frame. In. He had already shortened. Well, I thought he shortened that in. Yeah, I think Roberto shortened it a little bit. I, I see the line now. Oh, he drew sketches. Um, it's because my cat is uh, I'm displaying certain things that may not he made it, he hid. I think. Um, I think that he drew some sketches that shortened the CAD four inches so that the arms cleared the front of the uh, frame. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I could do holes from the horizontal. But I, I have a question about the yeah. vertical support Yeah. Uh, for the arms. They are going to be inside the, the arms now? Uh, repeat the question. The, ver the vertical supports for what? Yeah, where where are they going to be? Which vertical supports are you referring to? Those that support the um, the loader shaft. Uh huh. So we've got the loader 
shaft loader shaft uh, the shaft that binds the two sides of the loader uh, yeah I suppose I, I think this, that it's the only vertical part of the frame I mean completely vertical oh oh you mean at the back the loader shaft pivot attachment The pivot? You're talking about the mounting yeah. where the arms pivot? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. You're saying... I, 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 I wonder where... If the, the those verticals... Um, because in the current design, the, the arms are inside or... Yeah, I, they are inside of, the, of those verticals. And, and, and I wonder if... If, if we are going to separate the, the, the arms, then those verticals are going to be inside or or we are going to to to, to put the, them wider. Yeah. Um, you're saying so now the, the loader arms are supported on the inside of the pivot mounts there, right? They're on the inside? Yeah. Right. Um, Well, these are all related issues. Um, we have to strip this to requirements. Like, the number one question is to clarify this discussion: Are we making the cab a module, or are we not making it a module? Because if it's a module, that means it's completely independent outside of attachment, say, to the base. If we put the loader shaft through the cab then you bottleneck the build process. Uh, so, given that modularity is one of our first design intents, we should keep them separate. Do not put the shaft through the cab um, so that you can have the frame where you have the loader arm pivot mounts through the frame. That's what we started with. Uh, and I would say until we get to a catastrophic point, we keep that requirement. In other words, in the slide number three, we had the cab. Um, well, we missed the frame, right? So let's 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 go back to that diagram. So there's tracks. There's you can stack the frame here, uh, power cubes. But what this diagram means? is that each part is independent connected in a very simple way like the cab simply bolts onto the frame the power cubes simply like rest on the frame etc so the frame if it's independent then the way to attach the interface design between the frame and arms is that pivot shaft with the holes in the frame that's acceptable so you can work on the arms independently like once you figure out the geometry, you can build those arms completely independently. And we want to design it, design the build process such that we can do that independently if our goal is transforming manufacturing by social production. In other words, that we can build this in a weekend. So um, let's, let's start. I mean, that's a non-negotiable assumption at this point. We are designing this for a weekend build. So... Uh, in order to provide the economic power of that kind of a model. You, you have to be able to do it very efficiently in a social process. So part of the the event over the weekend was was the the amazing social interaction of people teaching each other and collaborating. And it was an eye-opener for a lot of people. And I, I really liked this particular crew because there were no sour grapes. Like a lot of times you get some person who's totally just on their own in a corner like doing their own thing without really collaborating with anybody we didn't have any people like that this time around so that was really good but we want to design a social process into this and therefore uh, an intense weekend build event is a format to achieve that so we keep things modular and we want to say that the arms are connected to the frame so I'm gonna make that explicit here um, so let's put an arrow from the arms to the frame
until further notice until we find this is catastrophic for some reason but let's not give up this point because uh, it's an important one so let's mount the arms to the frame then the quick attach goes to the arms the cab is literally like the cab is going to be complicated because inside the cab you have all the hydraulic controls and to fit those hydraulic controls that's like a full-time job for one team so we can say like uh, I do want to make that explicit the cab the cab itself is just a frame right with some maybe a, it might have a top it might have protective side sides and stuff it might have a seat but the part that's complicated about a cab is the hydraulic control lever hydraulic controls that are inside the cab okay so you want to enable the building of hydraulic controls pretty independently and then you can simply install them inside the cab but this all requires that we're clear on the modularity here so um, we can I mean I'll symbolically speaking I'll put the hydraulic controls separate from the cab but they're they're going in the cab uh, so I'm gonna put like hydraulic controls linked to the cab the power cubes linked to the frame um, there's the tracks uh, so we're getting more more explicit here what what happens here uh, we have the tensioner that we did not address but the tensioner is related only to the frame uh, and let's see so let's like keep spreading this so it's it's clear um, tensioner so that's the that's the modular breakdown part of the design process so you got the tensioner which currently and we can renegotiate some of these connections but we got to be very clear about where we are modular for the purposes of the build um, so let me continue adding these connections so tensioner connects to the frame and the frame but also the con the tensioner is uh, connected to the drive well the tensioner uh, you can say tension the tensioner is integrated with the driver the the motor is right on the tensioner so the tensioner driver is a module and the tensioner driver which is the sprocket Dry, so let's call it specifically drive sprocket is connected to the tracks okay um, the tracks are not connected to the frame uh, the drive spr the tracks are connected through the idlers to the frame so if we break this down we need to draw idlers and idler shafts so idler assembly, idler plus shafts, connect the tracks to the frame. So this is kind of interesting here, what you're seeing, the emergence of a kind of a formal al analysis of modularity inside a machine. So basically it's all the modules and which are the existent connections and which do not exist. So this diagram actually is... Uh, it has a lot of information in it so tracks connect to to idlers plus shafts which is the idler assembly and the idlers plus shafts connect to the frame so those are the the operating connections and if I missed something you can either add so I mean arms plus quick attach uh, arms connect to the quick attach obviously Uh, but this is it that's what we have so if we do the design we have to be consistent with it otherwise we say we agree on a different connection diagram but this if you analyze it allows for a complete parallel build you can build a quick attach you can build the arms independently you can build the frame independently cab independently hydraulic controls independent tensioner and drive sprocket independent power cubes are completely independent we know that idlers and shafts are completely independent and so are the trucks these are all independent teams that can work without any bottleneck that is very important and that 
uh, I would say is a is a big value of, of the system we've designed and implemented in the micro track so far and it's it works great so um, that's what we have so if the cab does not connect to the arms there's like a but there are constraints that you need to consider between the cab and the arms because the arms have to connect to the quick attach so I mean if we were to represent that a little more formally we can say so the cab let's draw broken lines as constraints that are imposed one, one upon the other and and uh, all those constraints I mean, we can draw up a comp like many of those constraints and we can define those constraints and that's perhaps like I would say the next step maybe we we go through this and actually you know label that as constraint number one and we say the cab fits between the arms you know there's no question about that that always happens so that is a design requirement and things like that you can get very specific on all the different aspects and I, I actually don't don't have time to go through that in full detail but what I can say for now is that there are different ways to, to solve this for example um, here I said this gets complicated but if we have a for example the crossbar where we're attaching the load we can use that crossbar to attach loader arm cylinders for example so that maybe maybe we can do this exactly as we have here but attach the cylinders in a different the curl cylinders in a different way so so it's up to us to do that um, and here I mean this mounting tang I mean I didn't draw this entirely correctly because that mounting tang uh, has to be within uh, between those uh, those two verticals those supports on the male quick attach right so and uh, it's MQA male quick attach um, so the there's gonna be the detail there was that there were those two um, verticals here where the the quick attach has those things on it those things um, and we should provide formal names for them so we are we're all on the same page all the time um, uh, the one inch pin plates one inch pin they're, plates yeah yep um, they have one inch pin holes right yep um, the, the pin attachment plates or something yeah, um, call them one, one inch pin plates, yeah. Pin plates. Pin plate sounds, is good. It sounds like the arms, um, unless, as long as those are on the outside, or as long as the arm tangs are on the outside of those plates, um, if we don't want to put them on the inside and narrow the arms, we're just going to have to narrow the cap a little more to get the arms, well... Yeah, or I guess we could narrow the arms and, and the tangs could go on one side of the plates or the other, actually, depending on how you weld up those yeah. the, the tangs. Right, so I'm, what I'm trying to show here is that the tangs can be like either in the middle of the loader arm or can be like on the inside of the loader arm, as long as that bottom of the loader arm is stiff that you can mount those. I mean, the pin plates could, for example, be like a one inch thick steel or 1.5 inch thick piece of steel um, the tank sorry the tang uh, let's let's explore the idea of the tang being 1.5 inch thick steel that's why I, I noticed on one of the other loaders here tang is a piece no let's make it just one inch because one inch we we work with all the time is a piece of one inch uh, thick steel and into it in order to make it more strong we can weld in like a, a bushing that's wider than one inch if one inch is not enough because one inch you can egg it out if you have a pin with a lot of weight on it going against it all the time the one inch thick steel will tend to it'll just get ripped after enough time so we want to reinforce it probably with something like a bushing inside that thick steel so if you um, okay so I drew the tang here so that's one inch thick steel 
um, and then there's the hole but the hole you can have like a bushing around this hole like something like this something that reinforces it um, something like that a round piece of tube that's welded in there that well this that that's a through hole there but like that uh, there's a hole through the whole thing uh, so I think that yeah that is you know it's a hole that goes through the whole thing but it's reinforced by another piece of steel that can be like this very thick uh, thick tube like DOM tubing or even XXXH heavy wall pipe that's one inch pipe that actually fits a one inch shaft pretty pretty reliably which is actually what we used as the material for the rollers on the track so that that kind of material like a very thick bush so that's a potential design you can have this one inch and then you can have this reinforcement um, right there and then you'd have your loader arms wherever the loader arms are I mean the loader arm is here um, but it could be side to side anywhere like so I'll draw it in a dashed line you can move that I'm gonna draw an arrow side to side as in you can move this loader arm wh where that is it, you know you can move it left or right you know like it could be here it could be there wherever wherever it is side to side um, so this this would be welded somehow into it yeah so yeah there's complications but what I see here is that we're gonna have some creative work doing this and I think what we did in micro track that was great I mean that that worked really well and it looks very attractive so we can do a good job on this too um, so yeah yeah but we got to figure it out the I really got to get going so maybe we can communicate still but uh, if you guys want to go back into the page number three life track requirements I mean keep adding stuff in there um, I mean I think for the cab we really want to have like 24 inch I mean that's only two feet yeah let's st stick with 24 inch um, between the vertical bars that you can get in there I think that's the main thing and I think we've got that pretty good okay. it's 24 inches now if we reduce it and we're using the four inch tubing but if we yeah. go to two inch then, then we'll have space between the arms and the verticals and all that stuff, I think. Yeah, 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 exactly. Use two-inch cool. tubing. That cool. might be... So two-inch tubing is industry standard here. I mean, that's common parts. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay, well, we're doing the whole frame out of uh, the 4 by 4s The only complication upon the two-inch tubing is we do not have any of the, that material with the holes already like the 4 by 4 tubing. So for that, we can weld it up. But then as far as the attachment of all the hydraulics and every other component, uh, we just have to drill more holes or torch more holes wherever we need mounting points. So that's the only inconvenient part. But we could also consider things like we're hanging, we're putting in more tubing members so we can actually hang things off or something. So yeah, we can figure that out. But uh, the advantage of the 4x4 inch is that it already has the holes where you can mount anything already. So, um, so the disadvantage there is is having to drill holes but also I mean just like we have the 4x4 tubing we can possibly consider now we have the 2x2 two two, and we also make that into our standard uh, box beam with the holes I mean we can take that on a torch table and make that uh, as a standard part it would be quite useful um, though a one inch hole through that would weaken the material like we have one inch holes on the other one other one so we're, we're primarily using one inch bolts I'm trying to really reduce as much as possible to simply one inch bolts because they're very strong and all of that. So if you do the the two by two, you'd have to use probably smaller than two one inch bolts. Uh, but three quarter probably would be good, and we do use a lot of three quarter. We don't use so much of half inch because uh, we're you know we're trying to pay attention to like really serious part count reduction. So we we do use a lot of one inch, three quarter inch. I mean half inch is very very common. Um, and we, we might have to just use that for the thinner frames and, and of course the thinner frame does not have as much strength so you couldn't um, like it's not as structural it's not gonna be as structural as the as the 4x4 I mean the 4x4 
probably a tree can fall fall on you and nothing would happen like a full tree uh, it depends how big it is but with a 2x2 two two, I mean you know you might have to put in some extra reinforcement if you want to have a cab that protects you from actual like things like trees falling on you and stuff like that so so you know there's trade-offs but I, I think we can do that two inches quite strong I mean that will you know that will protect you from most things I mean that's that's plenty um, so we're good but yeah let's let's try that if we cannot figure any other way to do the 4x4 four four, I mean the 4x4 four four is there primarily uh, for the structural strength the complete protection of the operator mm -hmm. so yeah but if we yeah let's let's continue on this and we can continue refining these requirements but yeah uh, there's a lot of interactions here so we have to be very careful how we design it but um, let's go from here so yeah I gotta get going guys though so let's quit here and um, I'll try to post the pictures as quickly as we can as I can here uh, I can go down there pretty probably do that today or something take take a bunch of pictures and uh, uh, go from there so yeah let's let's leave it at this here I gotta get going so thanks a lot and we'll continue talking let's continue on the internet and once again great job for the build team and the design team for producing this mean open source micro tractor it's uh it's going to be good so look forward to more more developments take care guys